uh, so for today's very special episode of our weekly CIS web series, I am honored to introduce Professor Lawrence Marsu, also known as Larry. Uh, he will be the recipient of the 2018 UC Merced Distinguished Confidence Scientist Award. Uh, for those who don't know, I don't know who that would be, uh, Dr. Barcelou is Professor of Psychology at the University of Glasgow and the Institute of Neuroscience and Psychology, where his lab explores the nature of human conceptual processing with regard to perception, memory, language, social interaction, reasoning, and health cognition. And also bears mentioning uh, that the people here in this room were asked to choose between several very excellent potential awardees this year, and that uh, you won by a total win. Um, it, wasn't even, it wasn't even close. So people are working. Um, and speaking of golf math and numbers, it also bears noting that as of about an hour ago, Google Scholar reports, and this may be an error, but it reports that Larry has decided 42,698 times. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> now this afternoon at 4.30, in this very room, uh, Larry will give a public talk on grounded cognition. It will be a kind of a broader overview. Uh, but right now, we're going to hear about the situated assessment method, SAM squared, a new approach to measuring, understanding, and predicting health behavior. Please join me in welcoming. That I've, it's, it's our most recent work. I've never talked about it before. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. I'm really interested in any thoughts you have about it, about it including graphs of computers or whatever. Um, but um, sort of the, um, the work comes from the grounded perspective, but unlike most work on grounded cognition, which addresses basic cognitive processes such as memory, language, thought, uh, this work it aims at trying to address health behavior. And in particular, we've developed something we call the situated assessment method, SAM, SAM squared, SAM2, uh, which uh, aims to measure, understand, and predict health behaviors. And uh, so far, we've applied it in four domains. Um, habits, eating, stress, and trichotillomania, or trick, or compulsive care. So first, I'm gonna start, I'll start off saying a few things about rapid cognition, then about the method, and then I'll show you results from these four domains. Okay, so again, this work is coming from the grounded perspective. I assume probably most of you know what that is, but just in case, the best way to get a feel for the grounded perspective is to contrast it with the alternative, which is the uh, infamous sandwich model of cognition, which basically proposes uh, that cognition is a model, a module in the brain, along with other modules such as such, such as modules for perception, action, action and so forth. Uh, with further assumptions that perception and action are largely irrelevant for cognition, um, and that perception primarily just serves to get information into the cognitive system and action primarily serves to get it out. In contrast, the grounded uh, perspective uh, assumes that just uh, looking at the, the mechanisms we would consider the core cognitive mechanisms is not sufficient to understand cognition because these mechanisms operate in a broader context from which cognitive processes emerge, with these other domains being necessarily involved in the emergence of cognitive processes. So um, unlike the sandwich model, the grounded perspective proposes that the modalities, perception is central to cognition, that cognition utilizes mechanisms in these systems heavily. Similarly, it uses mechanisms in the body, such as the motor system, um, as part of the cognitive system. And then following Gibson's original ideas um, about perception, you can't understand perception without understanding its coupling with the environment. Uh, the grounded approach to cognition makes very similar assumptions about cognition. You can't understand cognition without understanding its coupling with the environment and taking the environment into account. An important, another important theme of the grounded perspective is the importance of action. And the idea here is that cognition is not just uh, sort of operating in a vacuum, but instead that co the cognitive system primarily exists to support intelligent goal-directed behavior in the environment. And um, one way
way to think about uh, this role of the cognitive system is with respect to something I'll be calling the situated action cycle, um, which is uh, outlined up here. Um, it's been called a lot of different things over the years. It's basically something that has been central to theories for decades going back. I think you can find uh, forms of this in classic theories of conditioning and behaviorism, certainly uh, classic theories of goal pursuits such as Newell and Simon, Miller, Galantri, and Pregram, or we propose something along these lines. And then uh, perhaps most currently, lots of theories of narrative structure and text propose that something like a situated action cycle is central to event structure or the structure of events and narratives. But basically, the way I've characterized the situated action cycle here is that something occurs in the environment, you perceive an entity or an event. This generates what I will call collectively self-relevance. Uh, various goals become active, um, values, norms, identities, and so forth. Um, sort of cognition related that's been cut that's coupled with what's happening in the environment that's establishing what what's relevant for you in the environment and how it's relevant. In turn, the self-relevance produces affect such as um, emotion and motivation, which often is now percolating down into the body. Uh, and in turn, this affect is producing emotion, both um, action back in, into the environment, overt actions via the motor system, but also internal actions with the executive system. And then ultimately these actions uh, produce outcomes in, in, the, in the environment, which can change the environment. And then this whole, set, this whole cycle just iterates um, because you're now processing a new environment perhaps and having to figure out what to do next to uh, pursue your goals. So um, one thing that, um, I've, uh, uh, that I really like about the situated action cycle is it provides a natural way to tie together the domains of grounded cognition. So here are the domains of grounded cognition that I just showed you a moment ago, cognitive mechanisms, the modalities, the body, and the physical and social environment. And the situated action cycle integrates these all as follows. So something occurs in the environment. Uh, in turn, this produces states of self-relevance in the cognitive system. In turn, this produces affect uh, within the body. Uh, in turn, this produces action back out into the environment, which then produces outcomes which change the world. So the situated action cycle provides a really natural way of thinking about how all the various uh, domains of ground and Okay, so what are the implications of this kind of approach for health behavior? Um, well, so I think one, perhaps the most basic assumption we, that we make is that uh, health behaviors are basically involves a goal-directed situated action and a constantly engaged um, situated action cycle that in these behaviors, the brain, the body, the modalities, and the environment are all, are all coupled together, you know, following that kind of situated action cycle that I just went through a moment ago. Uh, we would also assume that health habits, which are important to health behavior because so much health behavior is habitual, uh, that health habits result from repeated instantiations of the situated action cycle. Um, that, it, that establish entrenched situational patterns in the cognitive system um, with different sort of, sort of populations of situational patterns developing for different individuals which then it can be used to explain individual differences in how a health behavior is performed. So from this perspective, if one looks at a health, per, health behavior this way, a couple things follow. Um, the first is that if you want to measure a person's health behavior, such as their eating behavior, their stress, and so forth, you need to assess their rich situational experience. And then a second assumption is that you need to experience, you need to assess the situational experience across the situated actions. Um, and so basically what Sam Square refers to, the two refers to these two dimensions of situatedness. One is the population of situational experiences relevant to the health behavior. And then the other dimension of situatedness is evaluating that experience across the situated action cycle. And then basically, we've come to believe that um, this, this um, approach can be applied to any health behavior and also to non health behaviors. I think it could be applied to say something like semantics, for example. Okay, so um, this slide summarizes what Sam Squared, uh, what Sam Squared does. Um, it, 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 um, 
The first dimension of SAM score captures the rich situational experience if someone has in a health domain. And typically the way we do this is we go into something like eating and we figure out what the relevant situations are or stress. What are the, all the relevant situations that are relevant to your experience with that domain? Um, and when we sample these situations, we want to get both ones that are typical and atypical, so we have a, a large range of variants. That's important for the models that we're going to be exploring later. The second thing that we do is once we find what these situations are within the domain, we then, we then characterize them across the situated action cycle. And I'll show you how we do that in a second. Um, and typically, what we do is we find a dependent variable like the frequency of eating a food or how much stress you feel in particular situations. And then we look for predictors across the situated action cycle that explain variance in that dependent variable. One interesting thing about this process of finding these two dimensions of situatedness is that when you go from health behavior to health behavior, it, you get totally different stuff coming out as a function of, of the domain. But I think this general structure is really useful in pulling out relevant structure from each domain you look at. But what you get is very different, and you'll see that as we go through the four domains in a second. So then what we do is for each individual, we assess each situation on each on the, on the dependent variable dependent variable and predictors, and sort of more technically what we end up with is a, uh, it's a matrix, a, a situation times uh, measure across the situated action and cycle matrix for each participant, and then we'll, we'll perform a variety of analyses on that, but in particular mixed effect um, regression, trying to predict uh, the health behavior of interest. Now, I think it's also useful at this point to talk a little bit about how, how health behaviors are usually assessed. There are all kinds of um, instruments out there that are used to assess any kind of health behavior. I've, I've listed a few examples here, like the self-control scale, the perceived stress scale, the three-factor E uh, questionnaire. But what's typical of all of these is that they do not address specific situations or the structure of specific situations. They tend to abstract tremendously across situations. And this is something that has always bothered me a lot. So here's some examples of questions um, I'm able to work effectively toward long-term goals for self-control, or how often were you not able to cope with the things you had to do for the perceived stress scale? They're very general. They don't ask about specific situations or very much about their specific characteristics. Um, and, uh, and, and, the, and I'm not, I'm not trying to give the, I'm not trying to totally, uh, I'm not trying to say that these are unuseful. You'll see, that in fact, in some of our experiments, they can be incredibly but in general, I think we might be able to do better with these other methods, and that's what, that's what we want to see. Um, one other note is sometimes, although self-report measures can be effective, sometimes they aren't. So one domain we're very interested in is stress. And there's a lot of results in the last five to 10 years showing that the, the, most, the classic instrument for measuring stress, the perceived stress scale, doesn't, doesn't predict the really important physiological stress responses that a lot of the researchers are studying these days, such as various kinds of cortisol responses and, um, and various kinds of immune responses. So something we're heading towards is trying to see whether our SAM squared will actually predict these kinds of things better than the perceived stress scale. But I'll talk more about that in a moment. So basically, SAM squared offers an alternative standard, standard self-report instruments. We, we, we're not we're, we're still in early stages, but we think it might prove, prove uh, offer increased accuracy, greater information, and better ability to predict health. But we're still very early in that process. I won't draw any conclusions. There are clearly critical issues to, to address um, that I'll, um, I'll, I'll talk about at the end. Um, SAM squared is a complete self-report instrument. Um, I, I've never done anything like that where I, I get very uneasy with self-report stuff. But I actually, I think there might be some features of how this is done that make it less of a problem than it normally would be, but we can talk about that. Um, in many ways, SAM squared is actually an implicit instrument, and I'll, I'll illustrate those uh, later. Uh, SAM squared only assesses correlation, not causation. But again, we can talk about that, and so far we really haven't assessed SAM, to SAM squared's external validity, even though this is something that we so it's mostly just looked at as an inter it's internal, central validity. 
So again, we're going to apply SAM squared to habits, eating, stress, and trip. Okay, so we'll start with habits. Um, and these are some sort of current issues in the habits literature that, um, that the results I'll show you in a moment bear on. Um, so one classic idea about habits, going back to behaviorism, is that habits are controlled by the environment and that the consistency of the cues in the environment uh, determine the strength of the habitual behavior. So that's something we can look at. In the social psych literature on habits, the, a really important issue that sort of Wendy Woods and Pink Arts have been fighting about for decades is whether when you perform a habit, when you, whether a goals or evaluation takes place or whether they're, they're just purely ballistic. And our results will bear on that. Um, another uh, issue is how are habits related to personality. So basically there's literature showing that as self-control increases, like you know, performance on the marshmallow test, um, that people perform good habits more and, let, and bad habits less. Whereas as neuroticism increases, the opposite happens. People perform good habits less and bad habits more. So we can look at that. And then I, I, the other thing is that most of the work on habits just looks at like a small number of habits that focuses on eating or sleeping. And what we're trying to do here is develop an instrument that measures habits much more broadly. Okay, so this is um, an overview of, uh, of at least of, 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 of the first dimension of situatedness. What we did was we sampled habits across 10 diverse domains of daily experience. We took these habits from the literature. There are lots of great sites online about habits that are quite entertaining, actually. But we got actually a lot of great habits off of those sites. But these are the domains that the habits come from. So you can see they're extremely broad. Uh, we sampled both good and bad habits. So we can test things like the predictions for self-control and neuroticism. Um, so we have 10 domains. Now, four good habits for each domain, four bad habits for each domain, and so a total of 80 habits. Uh, and I think it's actually a pretty good collection. We've run, we've run this study five times and we've done a number of sort of evaluations of, of, these, uh, of these habits. And I think it's a pretty, it's a pretty decent set. So here are the habits. This is the, this is the first story, just so you can get a sense of the domains and the, the sort of positive and negative habits that Sample, and these are the other five domains. Okay, so that's the first dimension of situatedness. This is, this is how we do the second. So we start with the situated action cycle, and we start looking for variables relevant to habits from each of those phases. And to date, we've only sampled, I think, a small number of the, of the, of the, of the variables that are relevant. And if you have ideas for other ones, we'll be useful to look at. But from, from the environment, um, what we picked here was the consistency of the situations in which our behaviors perform. So like, you know, for eating fruit, for example, are the situations where you eat fruit, are they highly consistent or do they very well? For self-relevance, um, the classics would be, how much immediate reward does this behavior produce? How much long-term reward? Or, or it, actually, the question is more, do you do this because it feels good in the moment, or do you do it because it produces for affect, we measured, actually, valence here, most of the experiments was we decided what was good and bad, but in one experiment, we actually had participants judge what was good and bad. It totally corresponded to what uh, our a priori uh, assignments. So I won't talk about that. Uh, we also look at how conflicted people are about performing the behavior. For action, uh, the dependent variable was the frequency of performing uh, the behavior and then how automatic it is to perform. And then for the outcomes, the outcomes in many, this is kind of interesting, we've discovered is that the, um, the things, the, sort of the goals that come up in the self-relevance phase are often the, what, what become the outcomes as well. So in many cases, you see a lot of the same things uh, in self-relevance also showing those outcomes. And that's the case with habits. We also, um, in one experiment, looked at three other predictors, social approval, motivation, and uh, yeah, well, that actually, and, uh, and great advancements, actually. I'm not going to say much more about them. They don't change the results significantly, but I'm going to show you. So these are the kinds of scales that participants are getting, how the actual wording of the questions. There's usually instructions that come before each question. We're always rating things on slider scales. 
It's all being done online on, on Qualtrics and on Prolific. Um, here you can see these are interclass correlations for one of the experiments. The left number is the interclass correlation for the, the individuals. It's how much on average an individual agrees with another in the ratings. And you can generally see that there's a lot of disagreement um, demonstrating individual differences. This isn't unusual of all these very typical numbers. Interestingly, long-term reward is the one thing that people agree on the most, 0.53. And, um, and then these, these interclass correlations on the right are the stability of the means, and they'll bear on our regression analyses. We have very stable means, so there's not a lot of room for unreliability compromising the results. Okay, um, so we ran five studies uh, in this series. Uh, the first one was performed in the lab, but it was done online, but it is the people coming into the building. Uh, NF31, we, we then, because we were surprised at some of the results, we replicated, it was an exact replication. Study 1C was an exact repl replication of 1A and 1B, but done online, the participants didn't come into the lab, we got these participants off prolific. Um, study 2 was 199 participants, again online, we added in these variables. And then study three um, was a nearly exact replication of 1C, except we, in these other experiments, and I'm not gonna take time to talk about this, but we, we blocked the judgments for various reasons. And in this study, we, did, we, we randomly arranged them to see if that had an effect, it didn't. Um, so those are the studies. Um, and so we had a total of 438 uh, participants, all were students in the UK, aged between 18 and Okay, this, uh, this map gives you a sense of the kind of data that you can get out of this. And this is the kind of thing we can spend a lot of time on, it's fascinating. So uh, I just want to give you a sense of what you can get out of it rather than really go through this. Each of these here is, a, is, is one of the eight habits. Each row is a habit. And then um, each of these are, the, are the, here's the dependent variable and then five predictors. And these are standardized mean ratings across participants in study three. Um, and wherever you see red, that means that the mean for, say, the frequency is above average. Where you see white, it's around average. And where you see blue, it's below average. And you can see there's a lot of structure in this data um, uh, that, that could be uh, explored. Uh, all sorts of Oh, and the other thing that's going on here is, is that we're clustering these rows by the patterns of these vectors, essentially. So we find clusters of habits that have similar properties. Um, but well, I think a lot can be done with this kind of data, but we haven't really done much with it yet. Okay, here are the results of Baron personality. So um, these are, uh, this is, um, it, what we're plotting here is essentially the model from a regression where we're predicting the frequency of performing a habit with just two variables, self-control and valence. And so these are essentially the slopes of these functions. So this is like the frequency of performing positive habits as a function of self-control increasing. And you can see as the literature has reported as self-control goes up, positive habits increase in frequency, and negative habits go down. Um, and you see the opposite for neuroticism. As neuroticism goes up, um, uh, the frequency of performing negative habits goes up, bad habits goes up, and um, the fr frequency of good habits comes down. Um, when we got this, so this was the first study with 31 participants done in the lab. I, he didn't believe it. This is when we started replicating things. Uh, this is, so over here are the first three studies. This is all three of those and then here's study two and study three. And you can see this is a very robust uh, pattern. This is self-control um, and valence um, across the studies. And here it is for neuroticism. Again, a very robust pattern. Um, so, and what's different from this than most other studies that have looked at this is we're looking across eight habits, whereas most of the studies have looked, looked at this kind of thing before we're looking at a small number. Um, so our instrument is doing a good job of capturing um, this class of effect, this class of effects. Um, this next result I want to show you are, are group level regressions. And so what we have here are, I'm just showing you the main effects. 
but we also have two or three way interactions in this model. And what we have over on the left are the results from models that contain all of these main effects, all two or three way interactions, and then the random intercepts, but no random slopes. And we can't put all the random slopes in at once because the model won't converge. <coughs> and so what we do is anything that's significant here, we then test in the second model. So this is just all one model. Each row here is a separate model. In each of these models, we perform maximum testing where we put in the relevant slopes, random slopes for the effects being tested. Um, and to see whether, it, and this is a more conservative test, I'm not going to take time to explain why it's important to do this, but basically what we find is that um, of the original six effects that were significant in this model, only four survived the maximum testing. And then what we do here is we run the third model where we drop it out, each of these out to see how much variance there is. And so you'll see this kind of thing over and over again. But, um, but basically what I want to draw your attention to here are, are first of all the things that were significant. Um, and then the fact that these models are accounting for about 60, this is one study, this was study three, 65% of the variance, that variance, that's pretty typical across all the studies. It ranges from around 60 to 70% of the variance of the group. Um, so these forest plots show you the pattern of prediction across um, all of the studies, and I'm just showing you this so you can see how consistent the results are. They all show the same pattern. Um, the most important predictor in every study is consistency, consistent with, um, oops, consistent with uh, behavioral theories, arguing that the consistency of the environment is important for habit frequency. Um, the second most important predictor is authenticity, the more you automate, I mean, the more people have experience that those behaviors automate, the more um, uh, the third and fourth most important predictors are always uh, first immediate reward and long-term reward. So in terms of this issue of whether um, reward is involved in performing habits, I mean, these are, these, no, we can't infer any causality from these data, but they suggest that reward is important um, for um, performing habits. And there's a great new paper in JP General, if you're interested, which also comes very strongly into this conclusion with much stronger data than this, but this is very consistent with the idea that reward is important for performing habits. Um, typically, um, uh, conflict is, is not important, um, and valence is only important in terms of interacting um, uh, with, um, with the, with the, with the um, personality curves. So basically, you, this, this, the, we, repl we replicate the results both in the lab and online. Uh, there's also no effect of blocking the ratings. In these earlier studies, this is the one where we didn't block them. You see the same pattern. Um, so the next thing that we wanted to look at was um, one of, we wanted to look further into these interactions and um, with personality and see if the results that we have in, 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 in Sam Square can offer insight into the nature of what's going on with self-control, what's going on with neuroticism. So the, these are the original interactions just when we have valence and self-control or neuroticism in the model. Um, oh, okay, so, yeah, so this is just when we have self-control and valence in the model. If we now put in the other five predictors, consistency, authenticity, long-term reward, conflict, these interactions are no longer significant. So what this means is that these other um, these other things coming from the situated action cycle may have something to say about the nature of self-control and neuroticism. And the same thing happens for neuroticism. Here are the original interactions when we put in all the other predictors, the interactions disappear. So we then tried to, um, we did mediation analyses, multiple mediation analyses to see what, um, which of the other predictors were explaining um, the variance. So if we could, if we could explain where it's associated with the personality variables. And so what's going on here is we've now we've broken up the, 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 the interaction with valence into just one line each. So this is the function for uh, negative habits. This is the function for positive habits. And here we're um, trying to, we're looking at, it's maybe hard to see. Um, this is self-control. This is the frequency of negative habits. And, we're, and so, we're now trying to explain um, this relationship across studies. And here we have the same thing from positive habits in relation between self-control 
And so negative habits are going down, positive habits are going up. And we find a very consistent pattern across uh, studies, which is that automaticity is the most important mediator. And this is actually consistent with the literature, what people have been arguing is that basically what happens when people are high in self-control, they, they, um, as their self-control goes up, they deep, the amount of automaticity they have for negative habits decreases, as does the consistency where they perform them, and, the, and they experience less immediate reward for them. Whereas for positive habits, it's the opposite. Um, as as self-control goes up, the auto, uh, positive habits become increasingly automatized. They're associated with increasing immediate reward and increasingly consistent situations. The immediate reward is really interesting. We predicted that we would see long-term reward. And this is what many people have argued. And we're, what, we're, what we think may be going on is that when, you, when you're high in self-control, um, that the kind of the benefits that you get in the long run start to feed into your immediate reward experience such that behaviors become rewarding because you're sort of, but we, we're, we're really fascinated by what the nature of this immediate reward is in people who are high in self-control. These are the results for um, neuroticism. And basically, it's exactly the same pattern of results, except everything is reversed. But basically, as neuroticism goes up, um, people increasingly automate negative habits and they experience more immediate reward for them. Those are positive habits. They're, they're decreasingly automated and decreasing immediate reward. So basically, we think that this approach is helpful in understanding what's going on in self-control and neuroticism. We can sort of look at these broad sort of constructs in a much more specific manner by using um, sort of the tools that come from applying this model. Okay, so another thing that we do in all these studies, and it's going to take me more time to go through this, and then we'll just whiz through the next three domains, but as every, it's the same in every domain. Um, what we then do is we do an individual regression for each participant. So on um, each of the 120 four, I guess, participants in study one, 199 in study two, and 115 in study three. And each dot is the R squared from an individual regression. In these regressions, we're only putting in five predictors and um, no interactions and no random effects. And basically, we're explaining um, anywhere from, uh, uh, in the high 70s, so the median explained variance across participants in the high 70s. This, um, this upper line in each plot is the model that I, the, the, the model two that I showed you earlier with all the interactions and that intercepts and one slope in it. And you can see that the median explained various variance at the individual level is better than the best um, group model we could come up with. The lower line shows the group regression is exactly the same model as the individual regression. So just the five predictors, no interactions, no intercepts. And you can see clearly that we're doing a better job of explaining performance for most partic participants when we, when we analyze the data at the individual level and at the group level. And what we think this illustrates is that there are um, strong individual differences that are very systematic such that we can capture them with these simple individual um, so this is a, this map, uh, what we have, I think this is from study three, yeah. and each of the, this is each of the 150, each row is a, a participant, um, and this is how much each um, predictor is associated with um, frequency of performing power. Um, and you can see there, and, and, and the, we would have never seen this if we hadn't constructed this kind of plot, but there are all kinds of like, I mean, you can look at each individual, and you can see what's important for predicting their, their pattern frequency. But you, but you see a, one really interesting pattern is that there's a bunch of people for whom automaticity is a really important predictor, and an, another group of people for whom consistency is a really important predictor, suggesting that there may be sort of a difference in the role of the external versus the internal environment in controlling these behaviors. Uh, and again, we really haven't done much in mining these data structures, and, and, um, but um, I think there's a lot of potential in, in, in looking at the information that's in, in these maps. The last thing we do in all of these uh, studies is we assess people's metacognitive awareness of what predicts the health behavior of interest. So here we ask people, 
go to each of the five predictors and we say, how much do you think consistency is related to um, the frequency you perform these behaviors? How much do you think immediate reward is related? So we're kind of asking them, can, can you predict what's going to be important? So we take the pattern here, and then we actually correlate it with the, the actual correlations in the data between the actually the absolute value, but, um, to see how much, to how well they can predict the actual structure of their data. And um, each point here is a participant in study three. You can see the median correlation is about 0.2. Generally, people don't have a lot of awareness of what predicts uh, their, um, the, how often they perform. Okay, so um, conclusions. Sans squared provides replicable, replicable results. It provides rich, not just reasonable, but I think rich descriptions of both habits and individuals uh, in terms of performing habits. Um, explains much of the variance in group level regressions, provides a good account of individual differences, and um, um, yeah, so I guess that's, that's a good um, All right, so um, I'll turn that, I'll, I'm going to now go through the other three domains and I'll go through I'll try to go through, through them much faster because now that you've seen how the methods work, you'll see the same thing over and over again. So this is actually the third in a series of three studies I'm not going to show you them all. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict um, um, different individuals, how often they eat various foods and the desire to eat various foods. And um, we had a sample of uh, 205 individuals, again, run online with Qualtrics and Prolific. Um, we, in some of the earlier studies, we collected norms of foods and people in the UK. And um, we essentially took the, it, it, it's a very large set of foods from all the different eating situations that people have over the day. We just took four eating situations for this particular study with a total of 177 foods, essentially the foods that get generated the most often by the UK population. Then you had, um, and so this is how we're measuring their situational experience. The situational experience is essentially these four eating situations, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, um, with the foods nested within these um, situations. That's kind of a rich situational experience we're trying to assess. And then we um, look at the, um, each of these situations across the situated action cycle. We have two predictors, which are going to be frequency and desire, and then uh, ten predictors I'll show you in a second. And they did this they did this experiment in three sessions across three days, but roughly 45 minutes each. Uh, these are examples, these are the top 20 most generated foods in each of the four categories that we use. So this is from an earlier study. These are the predictors of dependent variables we sampled from the situated action cycle. There's a total of 32 here, and I'm not going to go through them all, but they're pretty much um, um, some of them. So we're working with like Esther Papias, who's an expert on eating, and we had other people in the group who were experts on eating. So we're, we're reading the food literature, and we're just we're taking everything out of the literature we can find that could potentially um, predict food, and then some things that were of interest to us as well, things that struck us as important from the perspective of the situated action cycle. So we have things from all five phases. We also assessed all five of, of the basic taste dimensions and then a couple of metacognitive dimensions as well, imagery and situation of um, In this study, we actually, because we benefited from some of the earlier studies, we just went with um, 10 of the predictors, um, and they're the ones that are listed here. I'll say more about them when I actually show you the results. These are the kind of scales that they're judging them on. These are the actual questions. Again, the interclass correlations from the individuals are pretty low, but what's really interesting is that the two highest are sweetness and uh, healthiness. We're down here. Um, it's interesting that there's the most agreement on those two uh, dimensions. People really know what's healthy. Uh, I think we're very surprised by that. Um, Okay, here are the regression results. So, so what we then did, uh, we, we, were, we were worried about collinearity, and we often submit these things to factor analyses, but we had very little collinearity, so we just threw all these predictors into the same regression equation and didn't really have a problem with uh, collinearity. And um, basically everything was um, predicted eating frequency. 
consistency except for bitterness. And interestingly, sweetness is, it's not very much of a prediction, but it's negative. So as things become sweeter, people eat them less. But um, everything else, and I'll talk more about them in a second, um, uh, was significant in the first model, has, uh, survived maximal testing in the second model, and then you can see the variance explained about the um, and we're explaining in, the, in this group level model about 60% of the variance um, in, in EV frequency. So um, these are the forest plots for the regression coefficients. I guess I should explain this better in the last. So these are the regression coefficients. So these are essentially um, these coefficients here from the model two. Um, when, when they, so you know, when they were tested for significance. Um, these are the um, coefficients for eating frequency and for desire. And you can see that in both cases, automaticity is the best predictor. Um, people eat a food, the more automatically they eat it. But um, really interestingly, the uh, next uh, two most important predictors are how much this eating this food is related to your identity. Um, and al also how much how much how easy it is to transport yourself to think about eating the food, how easily it is to just um, another couple of interesting ones are social connectedness is always important. Um, healthiness uh, is pretty important. Um, and, um, and then also how filling it is. And then to, to some extent affordability um, is also... Um, um, actually, so this is... Okay, but... Um, things change a little bit for desire. Um, healthiness... Uh, yeah, healthiness goes down and um, connectedness goes up and fillingness goes up. Um, sweetness is surprisingly um, never very important to as it as its bitterness. I think perhaps the thing that surprises us most about these data are the importance of variables like identity and social connectedness. These are really important for um, people's eating. And uh, you'll see some more of this here. So this is the, the map for the 170 some foods. Um, this is uh, uh, yeah. So the, yeah, yeah. And, and so this is how they they cluster. And I just again, we haven't really looked at this much, but I think the one thing that we find the most important, most interesting is this column here for um, social uh, uh, for social connectedness. This turns out to be a really um, uh, sort of, you can see that these big clusters are sort of breaking out around whether a food uh, produces social connectedness or not. And again, this is not something we would have known if we hadn't sort of mapped out the foods in this way, but what this suggests is that there are some foods that are really important because they, they're, they're part of what you do when you're with other people, and then there are other foods that are not so important. This seems like something that might be interesting. So here are the here are the individual the R squares for the individual regressions when we just do the same kind of regression I told you about earlier, and um, we're explaining about 75 percent of the variance, the median, the median 75 percent of the variance in the individuals, um, which is higher than both the best group model and the comparable, and even better than the comparable. So again, there seem to be large individual differences that this approach is capturing well. Here is the heat map for um, uh, the, re the prediction vectors for in the individual participants, where each cell shows how well one of these factors predicts eating frequency. And I'm not going to say anything about this, but except to point out that there are just lots of clusters of individuals who seem to have different patterns of what predicts their eating. Again, I think there's a lot of potential here is the uh, here are the plots of their awareness of what predicts their eating frequency. And you can see that for both, um, this is a zero right here. I know it's a little small, but basically, these part these in, in this study, people have the median awareness is, is not to have any awareness at all of what predicts your eating frequency. So again, um, Sam squared seems to provide formative descriptions of situations of individual um, participants, uh, sort of how they approach food perhaps. Um, 
It also explains a lot of variance in group level regressions, individual level regressions, and it leads to um, a variety of interesting questions such as perhaps looking more at the social uh, factors associated with the Okay, so this third domain is applying sense where to stress. Um, the standard way of measuring stress these days is, is to use the perceived stress scale, um, just like a, about a dozen very general questions about stress. There are a couple other scales that are like it, but this is the one that's used by the most. It's used widely. It has stress in diverse contexts, including uh, clinical contexts, um, uh, various kinds of interventions, and neuroscientists use it a lot um, in different ways I'll talk about in a second. Uh, it's also used a lot in online apps. Um, I just learned recently. Um, and one thing that we find very interesting about it is um, it doesn't predict the physiological responses associated with stress very often. So like if you look at uh, cortisol levels in the air, which assess uh, trait level stress, the perceived stress scale is, is uncorrelated with those levels. If you look at, oh no, I'm sorry. Yeah, it tends to be uncorrelated with those levels. If you look at inflammatory responses in the immune system, people over the course of a week, perceive stress, stress you know, doesn't um, um, predict those either. So we're, we're actually one of the things we want to do in the near future is see whether Sam Squared does a better job of predicting these kinds of physiological measures. Another thing about the stress literature is um, there's really no account, cognitive account of what goes on in stress. There are you know some very sort of simple principles like threat is important, that coping efficacy is important really don't have good cognitive models. So we're interested in trying to develop more complete accounts of the cognition that's involved in stress perception. So um, I'm gonna, we've, here we've again done three studies, and I'll mostly just focus on one. And what, what I think is interesting about this study is we, we had 30% participants generate their own stressful and non-stressful events. We didn't, we didn't come up with a set like we did for habits and food and give them to everybody. We had everybody generate their own events. So everybody was coming up with about 48 different stressful and non-stressful events. And then we're going to have them, um, on a in a second session, we have them rate them on the dependent variable on each stress state, so we send them, um, and then we rate them on 10 predictors, which come from the same, oh, I'll show you that in a second. Here, here are, these would be examples of the kinds of stressful and uh, non-stressful situations that uh, participants would produce. This is actually from a later study, but this is very typical. We actually got these from that, this, for this study I'm showing you now. Um, here are the other uh, four domains. So here's the situated action cycle. Um, and this is from a, a, the, a first study where we looked at 20 predictors of stress largely drawn from the stress literature. And in the study that I'm going to show you now, we just looked at um, 10 of those because we sort of figured out a lot of them are redundant. So we'll look at how frequently the event occurs, how, how frequently the stress event occurs, how much it violates your expectation, um, perceived stress, uh, wait, perceived threat, um, classic thing in the literature, perceived stress is the dependent variable, um, uh, how much negative valence is experienced, how much arousal is experienced, how much efficacy, how much how able you feel you are to cope with the um, event, how much control you have in the situation, and how much you ruminate about it. Oops. And we then also have two metacognitive judgments, how much imagery you have of the event, you think about it, you ruminate about it, and how much you can you imagine being there in the situation. These are the kinds of ratings we looked at. We can't look at the interclass correlation because everybody's generating different uh, situations. Uh, there was a lot of collinearity here, so we, we, um, we, we performed factor analysis. And in this study, we came up with four factors. Um, uh, the first factor is loading make, how much negative emotion you experience in the situation, um, the threat, the arousal, and how much you ruminate, imagery and being there on the or situational transport on the second, how much efficacy you have in the situation, and how much it violates your experience. So then what we're going to do is we're going to regress perceived stress on the factor scores across these four factors, across, say, the 48 situations, or the situations that each participant generates. So they're, they're, again, we're, they're 
using, we're using each individual's own situations, and then the ratings um, from those original 10 predictors now collapsed into these four factor scores, but unique for each individual. Um, and here are the results. So you can see that by far the most important predictor, and this is what we found in three studies, is a factor that collects these kinds of variables, um, motion, thread, arousal, and illumination. Interestingly, imagery and being there are not important, they, it, whereas like, these were really important for eating, they're not important for stress. We find this amazing, especially from a simulation view. But um, uh, there are individ big, this is one of the places where there are the biggest individual differences. So, so I'll, you'll see that in a second. Efficacy is important. The more efficacy you feel, the less stress you experience. And then um, how much your expectations are violated, the more they go up, the more stress you experience as well. Down here, um, you can see that um, the, the three fact you can see the three factors that um, are explained um, that are significant and explain variance. And together, they're accounting for 80% of the variance at the group level, even though everybody's generating their own events. Um, and uh, here are the um, R squares for the individual regressions and also the individual factor analyses. And again, you can see that basically now we're playing a median of 85% of the variance at the individual level, um, and uh, it, it, which is better than both of the group models. This is um, clustering of situations by uh, values on the dependent variable and the predictor. And again, you can see that there um, are uh, there's a rich structure here that could be um, explored further. Um, and you can see, like for imagery, you can see how much it's, how much imagery varies across the different situations, um, and also the frequency varies a lot across the situations as well. Um, this this is the map for what predicts um, stress in the different individuals, and you can see there's a lot of consistency, but there are also individual differences. Um, uh, you know, again, imagery is showing. Um, uh, it, both imagery and frequency are showing a lot more differences between individuals. Um, there's things like threat and disruption. Of, 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 actually, this is a, a late, oh, so, sorry. Um, yeah, okay, so, sorry, I, I, I keep forgetting. So, these results are from a third study where everybody now gets the same situations, so not on their unique situations. So, you can look at this, and then this, what this now shows is when everybody gets the same situations, there are uh, lots of individual differences that reflect how different people are approaching stress, especially on things like frequency and to some extent on ethics. Okay, and then here's their awareness in experiment three, where they're, again they're getting to share the situations. Um, again, they don't have a lot of awareness of what predicts stress. Okay, same conclusions as before. It seems like a useful approach to exploring health behavior. Um, here's our most recent finding, and, and maybe my favorite. I, I, think, I, I can't believe, I, I never thought I would do a study on trichotillomania. Um, but we have some, we have some great uh, people in our, in our institute who work on this, and, and they, went, they, they wanted to try out this method. Um, this is because there's nothing like this in the trick literature. Um, um, and so we first established the situations where People who poll like to pull in where they don't poll because that literature doesn't contain anything, very little information about that kind of thing. Um, and then we also wanted to identify the potential predictors of what is associated with people polling. And in this area, there are three theories of why people poll, and uh, we also wanted to evaluate um, those three theories. So basically, in our first study, we had 58 participants. Um, who had trichotillomania. Um, we sampled them online from social media sites associated, associated with tricks, and they generated two to four situations from each of these domains um, where they poll. Um, and I should point out a couple of our of the people on the team doing this work are, uh, um, are hair pullers, and so they were our informants that helped us a lot in identifying the situations and the, the predictors in the center. And so we're having people generate situations where they pull and where they don't pull, and we came up with 230 unique polling situations and a little over 200 non-polling situations. 
Um, these are the, the most frequently generated in each type. You can see sometimes the same situation shows up on both sides. These would be uh, gen generated by different people. But so we now have these norms of, of all these situations where people, and how often people say they pull and they don't. Um, so then we, we then, from these norms, we sampled 52 situations that we thought that it could job with covering the domains of polling and just were also not terribly redundant with each other. So we had really broad coverage of the potential situational experience that people might have. Um, we then uh, recruited 117 participant, new participants online who have trick and then we had them rate the 52 situations on two dependent variables, how often we pull in each situation, we urge to pull in each situation. And then we looked at 13 predictors from the situated action cycle, motivated by the three theories. So here's the situated action cycle. And one thing that's been identified in the literature is that people often pull in, in certain physical contexts. But then people often say they pull in when they have in certain internal states. And this, this is the behavioral theory. It says the cues are driving pulling, both external and internal. Um, and the other sort of self-relevant uh, factors are people pull because it feels good and because it reduces negative emotion. So for each situation, they rate each situation in those two variables. Uh, there are some theories which say that people pull because of their negative affect. Um, and so, um, we measured both valence and arousal, and our theories often say that people pull because they have poor emotion regulation, so we measured how much emotion regulation had in each situation. Um, and uh, yeah, and we, all, we also refer to that as internal control, um, because of all external control in the second. And another big thing in this literature is experiential avoidance people, because people can't experience negative emotion and pull, so we measure how much you avoid negative emotion in these situations. How, about, how willing you are to experience the emotion in each of these situations. So our two dependent variables are the frequency of pulling and the urge, uh, how much control you have over the external situation. Some theories say that's important. Subtype refers to maybe the most important distinction in the literature, which says that some people pull very automatically. They're not aware they're doing it. Other people are very conscious and deliberate in how they pull. And then when, you, when people are conscious that they can be very perfectionist and very ritualistic about how they pull. Um, so we measured those for each situation as well. And then finally for outcomes, we have these two sort of self-relevant things here. But another really important thing is that when you pull, you damage yourself. It's this kind of self-harm. And so we asked how much self-harm results from um, pulling in each of these situations. Okay, so. Well, I'm not going to go into details because I'm running out of time, but I'm probably out of time. But um, you can, there's a comprehensive behavioral model. It's a behaviorist model which says the cues, actions, and reward are important for, um, for pulling. You have a kind of cognition beliefs model which says that you're, how you think about yourself negatively and, and then how you try to regulate that and change it determines pulling. And so you have know, drawn arrows to the things that you identified as relevant to that theory. And then finally, there's the emotion regulation theory, which says people pull because they have negative emotion. They can't regulate their emotions, so they pull. Um, here are the, the, um, the 15 scales that we have, that we measure, um, and the intraclass correlations in general. The, uh, the agreement is very low, suggesting lots of individual differences. Um, we found a lot of COVID, uh, kind of scales we found a lot of collinearity in the data. Um, and so, and we, so we started with factor analysis and principal components, but we didn't get solutions we think did justice to the data. So what we did was we created single, single, yeah, what we, we, we created single components for each of these pairs of variables that were that tended to be highly correlated. And this essentially removes the, the collinearity in the data, and it also put things together that really seemed to go together internal and external cues, uh, internal and external control. I mean, in some ways, we, you know, I, it might be good to look at these individually because they, when you actually look at the individual regression, some of these things break apart. But we did this at the group level to sort of make, uh, to get rid of collinearity and regressions. So 
So basically, we, so this is, the, we, then we combine these original two, two dependent variables because they're so highly correlated. Actually, in the literature, it's argued that these are very different things. Our results suggest that when we look at them across situations, they're the same thing. We can replicate this soon and be sure of it. And then here are the five combined measures, and then we also added in the three remaining measures that were just sufficiently independent we didn't have to combine them with something else. So we have eight predictors in that dependent variable. Um, and here are the, uh, re these are the coefficients for predicting um, for the frequency ur urge combined component. You can see by far and away the most important predictor are the cues consistent with the behavioral theory that kind of people pull because they find themselves in certain external situations or certain internal states. Um, also important is, um, is how much pulling reduces negative emotion and also how much control you have over the external and internal situation, the more you have, the less you pull. Um, another really interesting thing that we need to explore more is that um, the more serious the long-term consequences, the more likely you are to pull. Um, that's probably not a causal relation, but there's probably some interesting things in there that we have. So we explained about, at the group level about 70% of variance. Um, oh yeah, so every, oh, I guess everything's significant except for except for valence and arousal. And this is really interesting because the emotion regulation theory says that these these should really be driving and pulling, and they don't. So the more negative, so um, valence is defined as um, kind of a, a positive coefficient would be that you pull more in positive situations, maybe pull more negative, and then arousal. Um, I mean, they, they, it's just not, they're not predicting pulling. They, negative emotion and arousal are not predicting pulling, which we found surprising. So here's a clustering of, um, of situations. Uh, and again, there's a lot of structure in here um, that could be looked at further. Um, there was one thing I wanted to, oh yeah. So if you look at valence, you can see that there are situations, the blue ones are, are, are situations where you experience negative emotion, emotion, and the red ones are ones where you experience positive emotion. So most people pull more in the school, more in, um, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, yeah, it's really interesting that these pulling situations tend to be both valences that have a stronger preponderance of positive valences. Um, here's the, the um, R squared for the individual regressions. Um, it's up about 80%. Meaning that's my variance. Um, and again, higher than both the group models. Uh, and here is the, it, it, it's the map for um, what's predicting. So these are the 115 individuals, what's predicting, in this case, um, frequency of pulling. And I'll just draw your attention to one thing here. Here's the subtype variable, which is you know, the most, supposed to be the most important sort of thing in, in the literature in terms of individual differences. So there are some people who pull um, consciously and other people who pull automatically. And you can see it's not at all important to the, the hierarchical clustering solution here in the left. But it doesn't really seem to be um, as critical as some of these other things, such as the consequences, how ritualistic the pulling is, reduction of negative elements, and so forth. Here's, uh, here, here, here are the results for how aware people are, again, low levels of awareness of what we're doing. Okay, so again, the same kinds of conclusions. Um, I think you know, there's strong support for behavioral theories. Um, there's no support, doesn't seem to be any support for the subtype distinction. And emotion doesn't seem to be nearly as central as the negative emotion, especially doesn't appear to be as central to the um, as the emotion theory. Okay, so just a few final thoughts and then I'll stop. So, I, so at the moment, we, we're optimistic in thinking that Sam Squared is a useful tool. I mean, we're, again, this is the first time we've ever, ever presented this work, so uh, feel free to tell, tell us uh, how excited we are about this. Um, but, uh, but we think it has some potential, and we're really interested actually in applying it and in, in, in creating tools apps that people can use with these methods to work with health behaviors. Um, but there are clearly some outstanding issues. I'll talk about them briefly. Some limitations, use of self-reported experience. 
So the limitations, um, it's completely based on self-report data, although some factors that I'll mention in a moment might mitigate against this concern. Um, it's, it's, it, it's very likely that there are biases operating um, in these self-report measures. So for example, in arousal, there are well-known biases that affect um, re reporting of arousal levels. So this is certainly something one would have to worry about and take into account. Um, we agree that it's essential to go beyond self-reporting. We need to show that the, the results from this modeling exercise actually predict real-world things of interest and is useful to people in working with their, their, their health behaviors. And that's something we're really interested in doing. And then finally, this is completely correlational. Um, but we think it could be really useful in sort of providing hypotheses that can be tested with, more, with methods that have more potential to provide causal conclusions. So, um, use of self-report. So one, there's a, a, a really, I, I love this literature on attitude change, which uh, goes back to Osgen and Fishbein, where they show, and many people have shown since, that if you, add, if you measure an attitude in general, it doesn't predict behavior, but if you measure an attitude very, in very specific situations, it often does a really good job of predicting behavior. So what we're doing, it's sort of analogous to you know, what traditional self-report instruments do what we're doing. Um, so traditional self-report instruments measure things at a very general level. They don't get down to the situational level. But what this approach does is measure things in each, situa each, each situation one at a time and very directly. So we think it's possible um, that uh, because we're asking such specific questions that we're getting reasonable data. And I didn't really show you we, you, you get these norms out of, of each of these experiments where you can actually look, it's sort of what was in the heat maps, you can actually look at the, the values for each habit or each food, and they always look really reasonable, like, like, like people are providing us with good data and good assessments that aren't really being biased a lot. I mean, maybe that's just my you know, wishful thinking, but the, but the data look really you know, quite reasonable when you actually look at the results you're getting from these, these very specific assessments. Um, it's also the case that certain kinds of self-report can be very accurate. So in the frequency literature, it's an old literature on cognitive psychology, um, there was a lot of work showing that frequency judgments really track objective frequency quite well. It's, you know, it's like any other psychophysical judgment. It's not a linear fit, but it's, it's monotonically following. Um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop soon, I promise. Um, Another thing is that we're aggregating lots of data, so we hopefully are getting uh, stable profiles. Um, so the strengths, that, and then I'll stop. Um, we think that using this tool provides a sort of an initial way to map out the structure of the domain with all the relevant situations, all everything with respect to the situated action cycle. And again, we think this, even though we're only using it for health behaviors here, we use for other domains. Well, um, it also is a quick way to map out a health behavior for an individual. If you're working with someone in a clinical setting, applying this tool, you could potentially learn a lot about what's going on with the individual from applying. This is something we're really keen to do in the near future. Again, we think it might be more accurate than traditional self-report measures that predict things like physiological responses better because we're measuring things much more specifically, not at the general level. Another thing is that many aspects of SAM score are implicit. Participants aren't aware that we're measuring their health behavior, that we're aggregating things across all these situations, that we're looking at predictive relations. And the fact that they have such little metacognitive awareness of prediction is consistent with the fact that they don't have a lot of awareness. And so in many ways, this is an implicit method. Even though it's self-reported at one level, a lot of what's going on in how the approach works. And finally, um, we're really interested, as I mentioned, in using this approach to inform people about health and care through apps and, and using use clinical settings. We're, 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 getting, we're, we're starting collaborations with the Mental Health Foundation, the Lawrence Charity in the UK, to develop apps um, that uh, will use this tool in various dimensions. All right, so um, these are the people who, who have collaborated with us on this work. And it's great for them for all the efforts and contributions and thank you for your attention.